Marcus and I were talking pre-show. Uh, we've chatted back and forth uh, a zillion times on Twitter. You've been on our podcast, which I just linked up in uh, the chat box on the right-hand side, but this is our first time high-fiving each other virtually in the same room together. So, Marcus, it's a real honor. And uh, quite honestly, I'm, it's a little nerve-wracking as well because, number one, my boss is on the call. Number two, my producer for the podcast is on the call, and I always get nervous around him and his creativity. And, Marcus, I'm in between moving from uh, one studio to the next, uh, of which you and I have chatted about, the tall ceilings, yes. if you remember that. And I'm in my home office, which is untreated with my lower grade setup. Which so, still a high like, PR 40, which my, is awesome. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I got my pre-sonus. I only have my webcam because my cameras are at the studio. So I feel like inferior to you, as, as I normally do. But again, welcome and uh, excited to dive into all the stuff that we'll learn today. Everybody, uh, we really want to get into the Q&A because we reckon that a lot of y'all probably have some questions about uh, maybe a microphone, maybe an interface, maybe a recording uh, piece of software and stuff like that. So we do want to get to the Q&A. Feel free to drop those questions along the ride. We can mark those right in the chat um, and uh, we'll go from there. I'm going to try to save a little bit of my real juicy questions about Marcus's live stream slash presentation question um, uh, towards the end, but I'll be diving in and out of the conversation uh, as we go along. So again, thanks everybody for being here. Um, Marcus, you also, uh, you're me only louder on mm -hmm. Twitter, me only louder.com as well. You have courses, you have a new course coming. Yes. Am I supposed yeah, to say that? That's okay. It's cool to say. It's been coming for a while now. So. Okay. <laughs> it's been coming for a while now. Meonlylouder.com. Check that out if you have uh, if you want to check out Marcus's courses. I highly, highly recommend them. Or if you just want to hire them as uh, well, you don't do any consulting anymore. But maybe somebody's got a boatload of cash will back up into your into your driveway and say, please consult with me on the podcast. You can do that as well. Meonlylouder.com. Meonlylouder.com. Marcus. Uh, I hand it over to you, and then we'll dive right All in. All right. Well, I wanted to talk really quick about seven factors that I feel like every podcaster should be aware of to help them make their audio better. And often, I actually see them causing problems for people when you're not thinking about them. So uh, the first factor, I'll just go right into it, is your environment, your recording environment. As podcasters, we tend to think, okay, I'm getting ready to start my show. What microphone do I need? And the step zero before that is actually where am I going to be recording? Not just the room acoustics, which are important, how reflective the surfaces are, because your voice, that is the, all of the sound that is not making it into the microphone is going out into the space and reflecting off of every single surface in the room, the walls, the ceiling, your computer screen. But in addition to the acoustics and, and all those reflections come back at different times and that's where you get the reverberations and stuff. So you want to be in a soft padded space place with bookcases and curtains and carpet helps. Uh, and then you can see I've made some acoustic panels that I have on the wall. Those also help. But another consideration for your environment is the environmental noise. So if you are, you know, if your house is by a busy street or if you're by a train station or, you know, that sort of thing, trying to position yourself in the space that you have available in a way that is going to minimize your environmental noise. I have a dog. I have a son who's in the next room doing virtual learning right now. Uh, my partner has her office she, we used to share an office together, so we'd have to take turns whenever we were streaming, but now she has an office in a separate part of the house. But uh, all of these environmental factors impact your recording quality. And obvious, well, obviously to me, I've been doing audio since I was 14. I'm 48 years old now. And, uh, but the thing that, that I guess a lot of podcasters aren't aware of is the better that your source recording is, the better the end result will be. But more importantly, the better the recording is, the less time you're going to have to spend in post-production fixing things. And the number one thing is, is noise from your environment, reverberation, all that stuff. And there's other factors that come into play, but it all starts with where you choose to record and what you can do to your space to help improve both the acoustics and the noise quality, the lack of noise. 
I want to just yeah. hop in super quick uh, at Castles. So Castles Productions, we have our productions unit, which uh, again, Stuart in the audience is our creative lead on that side. Um, a lot of novice podcast creators come in to, well, let's first time podcasters. <laughs> they come in and hey, well, we need help creating a podcast. They record their first test and they say, boy, this sounds all pretty mm -hmm. echoey. Uh, that's usually the word folks default to. Um, and generally that's the reverb that's the stuff bouncing off of off the walls and i think for a lot of people uh and myself included as i stare at a blank yeah. wall right in front of me uh marcus in my untreated home office that we're all trying to fix here i could put up uh, a moving blanket yep. a yep. blanket or those sound panels who at least try to dial that reverb back a little bit um and then treating there's there's area rugs and stuff like that but i've done nothing else to these walls um so yeah that kind of thing can be done probably quite affordably of course there's way better professional solutions yeah. um the worst thing I ever did was search for soundproofing a room. Yeah. And I had to turn to my wife and say, it's going to be like $300,000 uh, for me to, <laughs> to yeah, that's podcast. A, oh, no. That's a good point. Let me, let me distinguish the difference between soundproofing, which is what a lot of the marketing information will tell you about product, acoustic treatment products and sound treatment, soundproofing versus sound treatment. I am not in a soundproofed place. A soundproofed place means that no sound will come in or out of the room. Soundproofing places is like what you see people who do voiceover work, you know, professional musicians when they're in a commercial recording studio. Those places are soundproofed and the door is like, there's two doors and they're like airlocks. And, you know, that is, like you said, a lot of money. I, I used to do studio installs and uh, the largest studio here in town is Blackbird Studios. My boss was uh, John McBride uh, back when I was touring. I used to work in the music industry. So um, that there is, you can do that, but it is very costly and time consuming. And most of us who don't own our space that we're in or we're not in it permanently, it's not viable. So treatments are more viable, but you can strategically choose the right microphone, which is my next point, so that you don't have to spend as much money on treatment. Because you will see people say, well, you need to spend more room on, or more money on your room, on your space, and on your acoustic treatments than you do on your microphone. Eh, if you get the right microphone and you have a good mic technique, which I'll also touch on, you may not need to spend as much as you think. So, uh, uh, Matt, you know, you said you could just put something up in front of you putting focusing on the area that is directly in front of where the sound is going to reflect first. So that is usually the wall in front of your computer when you're a podcaster. So if you just put something, a blanket, a cur a really thick curtain, like I have over there, um, blanket and curtain, you know, the, the thicker, the better, the more, uh, dense, the thing, the better, the softer, the better. Um, but, uh, you know, you have those, those foam acoustic tiles, which are okay. That, that are the cheap thing that I see a lot of people use. They, they do, they do an okay job, but they tend to collect dust. I personally don't recommend them because, uh, you can also get these felt tiles, which I have on a shelf over there. I should have grabbed one to show you on screen, but we can put links. Um, but th there are these like acoustic felt tiles that do almost as good a job and you can layer those. So, and you can use them as a pin board, that sort of thing, but just start with a blanket, just grab whatever comforter you have and just stick it up on the wall um, and, and try that. And, th and that'll get, you do not have to cover your head. Like some people do it under the blanket if you have the right microphone. So let's get to point number two, because I can talk about acoustics all day. Um, the, the type of microphone that you want to get, there, I see a lot of podcasters uh, using and recommending lapel mics. I do not recommend that. So, so uh, a lapel mic, you know, is the tiny thing that you can clip on, and they're very convenient, very cheap. It's essentially like what is on your earbuds, which this is essentially works just like a lapel mic. So you could, you know, you see the people on TikTok doing this, and it actually sounds not too bad. The problem with these is they are omnidirectional. So... What you want to be aware of with microphones is whether it's condenser versus dynamic and then what the pickup pattern is. So first, condenser versus dynamic. Condenser uh, has a, a powered pickup that is super, super sensitive, which means it can sound really, really good and very, very accurate. But conversely, it picks up 
everything around you. It is so sensitive that it'll pick up every noise. It'll pick up all your little mouth smacks, everything you breathing, you know, all that stuff banging on the table. A dynamic microphone uh, is passive. And it, it's essentially if, if anybody's ever opened up a, like a speaker, uh, like a uh, car speaker or a bookshelf speaker, it, it's essentially the inverse of that. So it's it's a mechanical thing where it's moving in and out. It's a coil, a copper coil against a magnet creating this. And all these voltages are super tiny. So the dynamic, because it requires more energy to create that electronic voltage by nature is ultimately less sensitive. You'll see people say that that it has better rejection. And what that means is it's, it's not, it's not necessarily actively rejecting the noise, like stop noise. It's just essentially not picking it up as effectively as a condenser mic would. This is a condenser microphone. The mic that Matt has is a dynamic microphone, but this condenser microphone is designed for what I'm using it for, which is speech. It's a broadcast mic. So it has a pattern that's called a super cardioid. And a cardioid is essentially like an upside down heart. So that in the front and the sides, it's picking up less on the sides. It's picking up mostly in the front. It's picking up nothing on the back. And a super cardioid is like super, super tight. So it's only picking up right in front and not as much on the sides. Uh, Matt's dynamic mic is a cardioid. Most mics are cardioid, uh, but... Our lapel mics are omnidirectional, which means it picks up everything all around it. Our laptop mics, if you're using, if your guest is using a laptop mic, the internal laptop mic is omnidirectional. It picks up everything around it. So you're going to get the fan noise from your computer. You're going to get the, when you're rubbing your leg, you know, against the desk, when you're nervous and bouncing your knee, you know, that sort of stuff. So this is only picking up like right in front of the mic. That minimizes the noise, picks up more of what we want, which is my voice and less of the stuff that we don't want. Now, the next point is mic technique. It, if I were to be further away from the microphone like this, not only is it going to be quieter, it's going to uh, pick up more of the noise in the room because I'm going to have to turn the gain up. So there, there I'm going to be cranking not just my voice, but the, the room noise as well. So the closer I am to the microphone, the better. This is probably the, the biggest mistake I see with podcasters that have most of the other stuff working for them is they do not maintain a consistent distance to the microphone. So their volume level ends up being all over the place and they end up being a little bit too far away. You'll see a lot of people do this hang 10 sign thing. That is for a specific kind of microphone and that applies mostly to voice actors who are using a studio condenser microphone that I have one on the shelf over there that is super, super sensitive. And if you get too close to it, you're going to overload it. This mic, Matt's mic, the mic that uh, um, most mics that podcasters have, like the AT 2100 and the Samsung Q2U, those are all designed to be used right in front of the microphone like this, not like this. So I try to stay as close as possible. The other thing to be aware of with micro mic technique is the closer you get, the warmer it's going to sound. So if you're not used to hearing your own voice, it may sound kind of muffled to you, but I would rather it sound a little muffled so that I can EQ it in post with less noise than sounds better to me as I'm recording, but ends up sounding too thin when you're too far away. And that's one of the things I like about this mic and, and certain mics is you this mic in particular is designed so that it doesn't sound thinner as you get further away and that's another benefit of it being a condenser the the mic like matt has like most of us see with dynamic microphones the sure sm7b which is what i used to use before this and i have three of them on the shelf over there um that they are very susceptible to sounding thinner when you move away and that is called proximity effect so the closer you get to it the warmer it sounds i like that Go ahead, Matt. One of the yeah, one of the things you mentioned before. Maybe we'll, you'll get into this in in other slides. But again, going back to what I see a lot of in in the novice podcaster or uh, the podcaster who's hosting somebody who's never been yeah. on a podcast, right? And that's that's a particular struggle um, <laughs> on you know a particular different struggle. But the uh, the Apple earbuds, yes, right. Uh, obviously, the AirPods. I don't know if you have a ranking system that we'll look okay. at later, but I think AirPods are far Absolutely. the worst. 
second place is the the earbuds with the with the microphone built into yep. them and the, and the particular challenge is uh is when people just leave it and and you did mention this but it, it kind of creates you're an audio technician i'm not but i envision it as like slowly rubbing together two pieces of tin foil <laughs> <laughs> like that's the sound i hear when it and you don't even know it you don't even realize you're doing it. it's slight subtle movements and it's it's just slowly dragging across yes. your shirt scarf your yes. hair and literally impossible well, i mean literally impossible for me to remove from from audio editing I mean, i'm sure you could but it would probably take you yeah. hours um that's a particular th challenge and i want to i want to bring up something that's probably the most controversial thing in in the podcast microphone industry um it's the it's the uh blue yeti yes I'm, now, I'm gonna go too. on I'm, <laughs> I'm gonna go i'm gonna go on defense that okay it might not be the best sounding tech technically sounding microphone, but I think it gets a hugely bad rap. Is that a phrase? Hugely bad rap because a lot of people go, oh, it's a, it's, it's a nice looking microphone. It's got a stand. I'll just put it right over here, seven yeah. feet away. And then as I bang the desk, like all the vibrations go yeah. into it, or they don't have the dials set up uh, correctly to pick up the, the, the pattern. Right. Um, I think it gets a bad rap because largely a lot of people use it yeah. wrong, but obviously technically it's probably not a, the best sounding microphone either. Sonic quality wise for what it is, it actually sounds good when you use it right. But like you said in the poll and, and seems to be the most popular answer, it's knowing how to use it. And and the reason why I don't recommend the Blue Yeti, I have one so that I can demonstrate how best to, to use it. And I've been meaning to make a video about that for a while, but there's already been a couple other people that have done them on YouTube if you search for it. Um, like you like all the stuff you said, I completely agree with the switch on the back that that changes the pickup patterns where you position it and all their marketing materials it drives me crazy has it sitting a mile away from all the people using it in, in the like brochure and stuff the, the other th reason why i see people love the microphone is because they can switch the pattern to the figure eight pattern you know to where it's picking up front and back and put it in between two people well you're gonna unless you're like face to face you're gonna be too both of you're gonna be too far away from it. it's gonna pick up too much noise and then i've also seen people say oh well i can just put it in the middle of the table and we can have like a four-way five-way conversation whatever that is going to sound so echoey and terrible no one wants to listen to that so if you use it like this and you put a, a the other part of microphone technique is 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 plosives. The word plosives, another jargon term, uh, which is the P's and B's. The air those are explosive. Plos the the part of the 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 word. The air coming out of your mouth is just like, and it overloads the capsule. The Blue Yeti is super susceptible to that. So you have to have a windscreen. That's a plosive. Condensers in general are very susceptible to that. So being aware of all these things, I, you can I can get actually a really great sound from this if if I know because I know what I'm doing. So uh, and that's why you see the TikTokers holding it like this. That is the best way to get the sound is get it close to your mouth, but not in front to where you're getting all your breath on it. Now, to your point, the rustling noise of the you know rubbing up against your shirt. That is a problem. And why does that happen? That goes to my next point, which uh, someone mentioned this in the chat about headphones. This is another major problem, especially for guests. When you're recording, I always recommend having headphones. I even do it when it's just me. And I, and I disagree with my friend David Hooper, who does not like to use headphones when he doesn't have to. But I use them because... I want to ensure that I get the best audio recording possible. And if I can't hear what the microphone is doing, there is a very good chance that I might accidentally bump the mic. I might, you know, bump the table. I might, you know, I might forget to press record, whatever it is, you know, the, having the headphones on helps you not just get in the zone, but get the best audio quality possible with that with the least amount of noise it also helps me make sure that i'm consistent because i can hear when i get too far away so i can maintain a cons consistent distance to the microphone now with these headset microphones and earbud microphones headset you know i see a lot of people say what's the best headset i don't like those either because a similar problem you don't have the rustling but you have breath and you have bumping and earrings and hair sometimes but um can can be heard on that my beard <laughs> You can't hear yourself in these. In the headphones, all you hear is the other person. They're not designed to be able 
to allow you to hear yourself. So I want a recording system and a USB microphone that lets me hear myself so I can make sure in real time that I'm preventing problems from happening happening so that I won't have to waste valuable time in post-production fixing those things that I would be aware of and stop doing. And, and this is something that's hard with guests, especially because generally they're using this kind of thing and they can't hear themselves. So it is very hard, but it is worthwhile to say, to interrupt, not interrupt, but to pause them after they finished an idea. This is what I like to do. Let them finish the idea. And if there's a really bad rubbling or thumping or their microphone gets quasi unplugged so it crackles or what or they've got a short because the headphones are really old whatever it is take the time in the interview it, yes it derails the discussion a little bit but it's worth it to say i'm so sorry there's this noise whatever it is thumping the table can you not ba bang on the table when you're talking because that's coming through the microphone or whatever it is in real time letting them know this is sounding bad here's how you can prevent this from sounding bad. And can you restate that last thing that had all the bad noises in it so that we can have a clean version of it? There is absolutely nothing wrong with doing that. And it, and there, it, you have to make that decision. It's hard, especially when you're dealing with people uh, like in the shows that I am that are celebrities and the, the host is really nervous. So it makes the host even more nervous. So, uh, but if you're the host yourself, you know, it's finding that balance and it's tough. It is very, very hard, but uh, you'll never get that time back right. either. Right. So like, especially if you're dealing with we, like we deal with a lot of B2B podcasts, these are whatever CEOs, C-level, C-suite executives. And they're like, yeah, I don't even want to do a podcast, but okay, I'll give you this yeah. hour. And then you'll never get that time right. back. So might as well just be a little uncomfortable now or maybe opt for doing a, a pre-interview, yeah. right? And this is very popular. Get a pre-interview before the interview on a different day to quick 10 minutes, do a little tech check, make sure they're aware, you're aware, and once you get to the interview, you should be yes. good to go. And uh, Craig pointed out, it's very important to have them restate the whole idea and not start and stop mid-sentence. And as someone who edits a lot, that is very helpful because trying to piece together two sentence fragments that don't really fit uh, especially if the microphone was like dangling in the wrong position and you try to piece it together with the part that sounds better, it, it creates another kind of problem with, you know, we want to create the, the most seamless and least distracting listening experience possible. So I'm thinking about all these things at the same time. It is not as simple as just sticking a microphone in front of your face in front of a guest and hitting record. <laughs> so there's all these things and it's, and it's tough. And the more you do it, the more, like, like when my analogy that I like to use is like all of us remember what it was like the first time we sat behind a steering wheel in a car and every single motion we had to make with a turn signal and the brake pedal. And, you know, if you're old enough, the gear shift and all that stuff was everything was stressful and you had to think about it. But now that I'm 48, I, it's like, I'll be driving down the road. I'm like, I don't remember the last 10 miles. <laughs> what happened? <laughs> like, cause my mind is, cause I'm on autopilot. So it, it, the more you do this, the better you get at it. Unless you have to consciously think of all this stuff, but it, it, you got to start somewhere and we all start where we're at. All right. So move the next thing uh, a little more halfway through with my points. I want to leave time for questions. Uh, the next thing is the volume level and it starts with your pre. Well, actually it starts with your voice. And this is actually my last point that I'll get to later, but the loudness starts with your voice, it, the proximity to the mic. And, but then the preamp level is the other problem uh, that your, your gain is either too high and it's clipping red lights are bad. Uh, that causes distortion, which is that. And that is, almost impossible to well it is impossible to completely remove i have a plug in here in rx that i can make it sound less bad but uh you again you want to get the best recording possible you can always turn it up but i hear way too many podcasters that don't have the volume level loud enough and when you're when you're recording at a super low volume it actually uh makes things sound lifeless and thin because these electronics are made to have a certain level of signal go through them without getting too technical. And so the closer you can get 
to like the louder she can make it without clipping, the better it's going to sound. And that's what I try to do. And then I adjust in post-production to kind of get the, the level overall. And then that's the other piece of it is in post-production, making sure you have a process that ensures that you're re reaching the recommended loudness, which we're going for. And those of you who've been doing this for a while probably have heard the term minus 16 lefts, which I won't get into here, but that's the loudness goal. So having a metering system that lets you see on the screen to make sure you're hitting that, but also using your ears when it comes to balancing the two voices. So I use a combination of both the visuals on the screen of the meters, but I also listen. So, uh, and, and it take, that's another skill that takes time to get good at. So loudness, make sure you hit that loudness. Uh, and I, I don't want to, we can talk about that later if anybody has questions about it, but, um, so anything, Matt, that you have to add to that about loudness? No, I mean, we could probably talk about this in the Q&A, but I think the one, well, as an amateur editor <laughs> myself, uh, I I rely on the fact that, like, I use Hindenburg, and if I do, I'm doing something super quick, Descript, um, or like I'm framing a show, I'll, I'll use Descript. The good news is, is uh, and you might not like this, Marcus, but it it has an export minus yes. sixteen lefts. All I know is I'm setting Absolutely. it to that, and I'm not moving not it. Right, so it. Yeah. Hope, you know, a lot of these apps these days um, are doing that for you. And I remember starting ten years ago and not knowing what the heck anything was because none of it was easy back then. I'm sure yeah. you know. Um, so it's good that these apps these days. Uh, will normalize those tracks. And Hindenburg you. is a fantastic or that output. Yes, exactly. And it, it uh, Hindenburg also has the thing. Uh, you're still on mute. I'm I'm muted. Am I muted? Hello? Oh, maybe okay. not. <laughs> maybe I can hear you. Fine. Okay, cool. Yeah. <laughs> you continue. Uh, <laughs> I'll do some <laughs> shooting on this side. Um, yes. So Hindenburg is a great tool. And it actually also, when you drop the audio files in by default, it it brings the levels so that it balances everything out. And and I, I do like that export function. Uh, and it is worth the extra expense that the software costs compared to the free options. Um, so the next point is digital file format, which kind of has something to do with what you were talking about with how Hindenburg helps you export it. I do see some podcasters that find the sample rate and, and other settings, and they actually set it wrong so that it ends up either creating a file size is too large. And then the other thing, which I, I don't want to get into now, but just being aware that the, the bit rate, you know, MP3 versus AAC, all, all that stuff. Uh, it matters. And especially when you're recording, uh, making sure the sample rates are consistent. There, there are these technical things that, especially when you're dealing with guests on another computer system, that could end up causing problems for you if you're not aware of them. It's not as simple as just taking whatever file or just hitting one button and hitting record. There are things that I like to check and make sure are set consistently. Uh, and then I know what to do if we if I do end up getting two different sample rates and which bit rate I need and all that stuff. So being aware of your file format and then the 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 the, uh, the bit rate on the MP3 or AAC file is super important. I like to do no lower than 128 kbps constant bit rate for my MP3s and AAC files. I usually actually do 180 for stereo because I can actually hear some artifacts on the 124. If you're doing mono, that's for stereo. If you're doing mono, it's half of the number of audio tracks. So you actually split that bit rate in half to get the same audio quality. So you can do 64, uh, sorry, 128 and 64 for mono. 128 for stereo, 64 for mono. Uh, constant bit rate, not variable. Because um, that causes problems with scrubbing. If you try to scrub through the episode, uh, you end up way off the mark because it can't reference the actual time because it's variable. So, uh, and then, so that would be uh, 80, sorry, 80 mono is what I do, 160. Kill the, uh, <laughs> this is all getting very technical. I'm going to move on, but <laughs> you can message me or we can talk about this later. Be aware of the bit rate. That is the most important setting as you're exporting. And then finally... Uh, and that also impacts the file size yes, too, correct? It's, it's it, about... I don't know if you had said I that. Didn't. I didn't. I did not say that. That's a great point because okay. you want to find the perfect balance in file size and audio quality. You're balancing those two things. And the, you'll see people like, uh, you'll see people say, well, I, I sample, I, I use instead of 44.1, I use 32, which is what Zoom records at, uh, uh, 32 kilohertz sample rate. 
and that degrades the audio quality beyond what I'm willing to do because you lose some of the articulate frequencies that are the consonants used for clarity. So I don't like to do that. Some people do. It's fine. I like to stay at 44.1 and then the, the yeah. So it, it is a balancing act. All of audio is a balancing act. How close I am to the microphone, my gain levels, the how close I am to the wall, where I put my panels. It's all balancing act, the, you know, balancing the levels between you and your guest. Every single stage of the process is a balancing act. So, and you have to decide for yourself what works best for you, given the tools that you have. So the last thing is actually the most important thing for me, and that is the performance. And the performance pertains to microphone technique, it pertains to filler words, which is a big thing for me as an editor. Um, uh, so, you know, like, yeah, uh, I think, you know, all these words that, that get in the way of the idea and waste people's time, not just the editor's time, but the listener's time. I'm, tr I'm everything I'm doing as I'm talking right now, and I don't do it perfectly. And we are human after all, and that's part of it that I get pushed back on is like, well, this human communication, there's going to be filler words. Yes. But you want to balance it again to the point of that it's not distracting from people receiving the story or the message information that you're trying to give them. The other part of the performance is being aware of like how I talk with my hands and I'm not bumping the microphone. Uh, just being prepared mentally, just like there, my brain just kind of stopped. If your brain is stopping too many times, that gets very distracting. It makes it hard to maintain the listener's attention. So being aware of all these things, uh, your voice is an instrument. It is a very dynamic instrument. So taking care of yourself, your health and your voice, drinking water, all that's eating, which I didn't do before this. So I'm starting to feel blood sugar, you know? Uh, so all of these things have an impact on the end result. It's not just the actual words. It's how you deliver them. So that to me is a performance. So, all right. I knew you'd call me out on at some point in this <laughs> in this presentation. Uh, the filler words for sure. Right? We all and struggle with. I think we, we, yeah, we struggle with it. Luckily, I just recorded a podcast before this, so I feel like I'm in the zone a little bit. Uh, sans the mishap with my phone ringing and my headphones switching over ah. to it. Uh, hard wires, people, yes. hard wires is a lesson learned live right on the air. Uh, again, if I wasn't switching studios, I'd be in my studio. Uh, you know. We'll, we'll, well, I guess we'll move to a and a but let me, let me just hit one thing, talking about apps, talking about how podcast industry is evolving, tools are getting easier, better, faster, robots are doing this stuff for us now. Descript, which comes up a ton of mm -hmm. times, has that uh, filler word removal. I'm sure that's uh, heresy in your world, is it? Maybe, maybe not. Uh, using a one-click filler word removal tool? Do you have any thoughts on that? It's tricky. I don't personally use it because my clients pay me to make the most seamless edit possible so that you can't hear when I'm making the edits. With Descript and any AI thing that's removing things for you automatically, there's no way that it can accurately cut it and then stream, uh, stitch it back together perfectly to where it would sound like I was talking and I never said that word in the first place. So I can hear usually when somebody is publishing an episode that they have edited and descript because there's usually breaths that are chopped in half or there are words that are run too close together. The other thing is when people use the space removal tool, our communication, this is about podcasting, it is about communication and it's it's about making that human connection through not just the words themselves but how they are delivered and as humans we have a natural cadence that impacts how that information is received and whether or not people can trust you and especially when you're removing breaths you're removing breaks all this stuff I, I remove, I do remove loud breaths that are distracting, but I don't put the word, I used to put the words together, but then it was like people get stressed when they don't hear somebody breathing. So you have to at least leave space in there as if the person was breathing, if you end up, you know, either lowering the volume or whatever. So it's, it is, again, it's a balancing act. So I, I know in Descript, you can go back in and adjust things, but it's, it's 
for me, it takes just as much time for me to do it manually than it would be to go back through and make sure each of those transitions. But again, it's the balance of your time versus what you are happy with as the end result and you think your listeners are willing to put up with. So if you don't have the time or the money to hire somebody like me and you don't have the time to do it yourself, then you have to make that choice. Is it worth it to use this tool in this way or do you want to invest the time for the sake of your listeners if you are able to? I want to prompt folks to, if you have questions right now, you can just start dropping them in the chat. We will start answering those. I want to toss another, uh, I was going to say grenade, but this sounds <laughs> sounds a little too aggressive. <laughs> I'm going to throw a question to you. I, I recently did a video. I'm pulling it up now so I can link it in the chat uh, on our YouTube channel. How much does it cost to start a mm -hmm. podcast? Here's the number I came up with. This accounts for... Um, podcast hosting at Castos, right? So you're paying for the hosting. And I, I also threw in um, paying for something like Descript or maybe another a tool like a Hindenburg. They're all roughly the same price for a year license. I came up with the number $1,041. Pretty good. Do you, f you think that's a fair assessment for the entry level, but still professional sounding yes. podcast? Is that a number that resonates? For someone with? who is wanting to create a podcast that isn't terrible. <laughs> that is definitely good. And, and so this other thing is choosing to invest to financially into this craft. And, and it depends on if it's serving your business, especially, you know, it can be a tax write off. So approaching this as a business endeavor, but there are many, many podcasters that are just doing it for fun. Obviously you have to decide for yourself. You know, I'm a hobbyist woodworker. I have dumped thousands and thousands of dollars in woodworking tools. So, you know, if you're a photographer, you, you spend money on lenses and tripods. So people that don't want to spend money on something that is at least bringing them enjoyment, but especially if it's helping your business or helping your brand, you, you need to weigh those things and consider the cost versus time. Cause that's the other thing is the, the Better tools don't always save you time, but typically they do. Um, and, and this is something controversial that I'm going to say about Audacity. Audacity is a fantastic app because it has empowered so many people across the globe to do audio. However, you have to be aware of its shortcomings. Uh, when it comes to post-processing, it is destructive, which means you have to render each EQ, compression, all that stuff to the actual audio file and so each step along the way whereas in my system i'm adding things in real time and i can adjust them as i go and it doesn't actually do the things destructively until i hit that final render button for the final mix so i can continue to adjust things as i go without the destructive you know reformatting of the original source file the other problem is audacity is hands down the most unstable audio editing app period it is open source, which is uh, has a lot of great things with it. But and, and I'm not saying that it is a terrible app. I'm just saying you have to be aware of these shortcomings. Hindenburg, Descript, Descript has its own issues too because it's you know uh, there can be some stability things with that too, especially depending on what computer. And so that's the other thing is just being aware of your tools in general, your computer system, your environment, all of these things. There are all these things to be aware of that add up. And so I want to spend the money that I can afford to on the best possible tools that I can to make sure that I don't waste time. And I especially do not lose a recording. That is the worst nightmare scenario. And there are more people using Audacity that have lost audio recordings completely. And it breaks my heart. So just be aware of that if you're an Audacity user. <laughs> one other one other point I want to bring up and uh then we'll go to the, the chat questions. Um, if Craig finds any that he wants to mark as a question, one of the things that I learned early, not early, kind of late, but <laughs> early ish on when I started investing more into, into YouTube and creating videos, um, after whatever, being five years in, in podcasting is all of the stuff, you know, like I feel like sometimes we're, we're, when we're giving advice as, air quotes, seasoned podcasters, we're playing in the margins yeah. a lot. And a lot of people might turn to us and be like, $400 microphone versus a $200 microphone. Is it really going to be a difference? When I started investing in 
in the doing the stuff on YouTube, having a studio where the lights are the yes. same every single yeah. time where my micro my boom microphone i used to do more boom microphone uh shots was in the same place and dialed in all the right because what i used to do is put it all up take yeah. it all down put it all up take it all down and it was literally this a different shot and i was in post editing going god why why is it terrible in this video and good yeah. in this video and i had to recreate the shot which is finally investing in studio space because the mere fact of not having to tear everything down and rebuild it which some people might be like ah it's just it's just 20 minutes it's just 40 minutes yeah but every single yeah. time and then i have to edit it all adds up in this space um both audio and and video I, absolutely I and my background is in touring audio production. So I used to have to set up and tear down every single day in a different city for these concerts, you know, arenas, stadiums. We, I was on the Creed tour in 2002 and we had nine semi trailers, 53 foot trailers full of equipment. I had two that was just audio stuff. And I was one of four guys that helped set it up and tear it down every day. The quickest loadout we had for those nine semis from the time the show ended to the time the last doors on the last truck were closed was 45 minutes, which was a, like unbelievable. Usually it takes hours. To, yeah. yeah. Like, like, so yeah. to your point, there are ways that you can, you can um, shortcut on time with setup and tear down stuff, but having that dedicated stuff that you can just leave set up. That's how I, I do zoom calls with this setup because all I have to do is press one button and I'm ready to go. And it, yes, it is overkill, for you know me having my two thousand dollar camera and this you know professional light and all this stuff but it's there it's set up so i can either do a youtube recording or i could do a coaching call or i can talk to a new client which this impacts that they're like wow you look and sound amazing i feel really good about paying you a lot of money to help me with my podcast or my video stream so all of these factors add up and time is the one thing that i cannot make more of i can always make more money uh, I, but I cannot make more time. And so investing financially when I can, I'm not saying you have to go into debt, you know, for the stuff, but you, and I've also <laughs> slowly built stuff over time. I did yeah. see a question in the yeah. chat of like the, the, where do you start? Like what's the absolute cheapest microphone? They, they were asking for a guest, but as a podcaster, and I actually use this for my guests too, the Samson Q2U is my favorite because it is by far the, uh, most affordable mic that sounds the best and it is uh usually I, i've found it for as cheap as 45 dollars, especially with black friday being around the corner b and h usually has them on sale quite frequently uh you can i have six of them because i send them out in kits to uh yeah. guests and they're just sitting in a pile over there but it is it sounds so good for 60 dollars. uh it sounds better actually in my ear than your high pl 40. Sorry, Matt. <laughs> but, yeah, that's, that's listen. I knew you'd be taking shots at me today. I'm I'm here for it. I'm but, here for it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I have the Samsung. Which uh, which mic do you have? I used Craig. the Audio Technica ATR twenty one hundred for a Samsung. long time yeah, until I dropped it one day and it stopped working. Um, but that's mm -hmm. the other one, and it's ATR twenty one hundred X now. Yeah, um, it's the other. Yeah, hundred bucks. It's also USB, yes. so there's no and, 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 you know you'll need other stuff. It, it's almost. Yep. Right. But it has XLR as well. So if you end up being in the same room with your guest, you can plug both mics in into an audio interface or like a, a Zoom H4, you know, recorder or whatever um, and use the XLR in addition to the USB. Uh, the AT, the Audio-Technica mics in that line, in that price range sound almost identical to the Samson Q2U. I like the Samson because it's slightly lower price, but it also comes with a taller stand and the windscreen is included so those are the two reasons why i, yeah. I get the samson over the audio technica stuff because audio Te i love both brands audio technica we used on the road all the time too so uh both are good choices and then for guests to answer specifically the question about what the best mic is for guests actually usually the best solution uh that i've gone with Nowadays, it's actually if they have a new Mac laptop, the new microphone array that's built in laptop does not sound too bad. You will get more echo, but I will use these and then inst instruct them or ask them politely to hold it up next to the side of their face if I can't ship them one of my mics. Those $20 microphones on Amazon that are condenser mics that come with the little 
tiny stand that's plastic and fall over and stuff, they they actually sound worse to me than this if you're holding it at a decent distance from your mouth. So, uh, you know, cho- choose for yourself. But and I'm actually going to I'm I've, I have written and I have the things to to test and do a video for all the different options for guest microphones. So I will make sure that. Uh, you know, if you follow me on Twitter, you'll, or well, if Twitter still exists. <laughs> down, <laughs> yeah. Tomorrow. Follow me online. Uh, and I, I will have a video after the beginning of the year. Once I move, um, with comparing all of the, the mics that people tend to use for guests. So you can hear for yourself and decide for yourself, which one you want to invest in or not. <laughs> I want to uh, answer Jill's question. She asks, uh, so will the right microphone eliminate mouth noise? Condenser microphones are more susceptible to picking up every little nuance of mouth smack. (laughs) Uh, I I recently had a guest who uh, used to be a a professional broadcaster. Like she was one of the co-hosts on The View, I think, for a while. Um, And she has this thing like my partner has called misophonia where you're really really sensitive to mouth noises and i could she was saying she was hearing mouth smacks and i was not but uh anyway I, she was like which microphone can i get and it's like no the microphone you have works it it is and that that is something when you have a condenser mic if you move a little bit further away again the balancing act you will pick up a slightly fewer mouth noises but dynamic microphones in general like the samson like your Heil PR40, like the SM7B, like the Shure MV7, all of those tend to be not as sensitive to those super high frequencies that mouth smacks happen in. So in general, dynamic mics, no matter what it is, are going to be slightly less susceptible. But when you are on top of it like I am, you're going to get mouth smacks no matter what mic you're using. The trick is making sure you don't have dry mouth. So preparing your performance drinking apple juice, staying hydrated day in and day out because you can't just chug a glass of water right before and expect your mouth smacks to go away. Uh, coffee can, if you drink a lot of coffee that can dehydrate you. So I, my trick is I like to brush my teeth right before I do a stream because the brushing your teeth gets all your saliva going in your mouth. So the, the drier your mouth is, the more those smacks are going to happen. So taking care of yourself and, and seeing it if you're, again, if you're serious again, serious about this, just like you are, willing to invest money and able to invest money, you need to invest in yourself as a podcaster and your instrument that people are hearing. Eat a bag of potato chips. chips. I think I heard you say that once. Yes, that that was a musician that did that. Uh, Before she'd go on on stage, she'd take a fistful of Lay's potato chips and the grease, something about the grease would like help her (laughs) mouth and her throat. (laughs) Eating an apple, that sort of thing. Obviously, you don't want to eat the apple on mic. (laughs) Please do not no, ever know that while recording, please. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, grew up in sales. I could tell you some stories about being on oh sales calls with folks eating lunch while I'm talking to them. No, thank you. That is yeah. something. Uh, one, one last question just will, and we'll wrap it up with that. Cause we are pretty deep into time here over 50 minutes. Um, I think Bev asked Marcus, what do you use? And I think that was in, I'm going to click the answer live. Uh, I think that was in the context of you were talking about audacity yes. at the time. Uh, so Bev asked Marcus, what do you Okay, use? so I'll go through my stack really quick. This is a, an Earthworks Ethos microphone, which they just dropped to be the same price as the Shure SM7B, which I love the Shure SM7B, but this mic sounds better to me. As somebody who's been doing audio for over 30 years. Uh, I, ha- I record into a Sound Devices MixPre 6.2, uh, I also have an Apollo X4 by Universal Audio, which I'm actually wanting to sell because I'm not using it to its fullest extent and somebody else can get the most out of it. Software-wise, I use RX10 Advanced. Uh, I And then I edit. I used to edit in Adobe Audition because I, I'm, I used to do website building like Matt. So I have all the Creative Cloud apps. <laughs> I do Premiere Pro for video editing. Uh, and I still, for some clients, will use Adobe Audition when that's what they're using. But when I have my choice and I'm not passing the files to anybody else, I use Logic Pro uh, because I am an Apple nerd and it is designed to be used with this hardware. Uh, if I was starting today, I would probably use Hindenburg because it is a fantastic app. 
Uh, I also have used Pro Tools being a musician person, but uh, it is definitely only, I feel like, only necessary to use if you are working for a network because you're passing files to other people and it is, quote unquote, the industry standard, blah, 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 whatever. Use whatever app feels most comfortable to you that you are aware of the shortcomings and strengths that fits your workflow, that fits your hardware. Uh, Reaper is another great one that is uh, very, very affordable that a lot of voiceover people use. And I know a lot of professional editors that use it too. That's super powerful. It's, it's, Reaper is the most powerful for the least amount of money. Logic is the next one of, in that realm. Uh, the other one is an uh, app by PreSonus called Studio One, which if you're part of the RX group on Facebook, that's what uh, Don can't remember his last name, but he does training for RX stuff. He uses Studio One by PreSonus, which is a fantastic app. So uh, I actually did an Airtable uh, comparing all the basic oh, DAWs. Yes. If, um, I don't have the link handy, but we can provide that. I'll post it again on my socials after this. So uh, and I actually need to update it because I think some pricing things have changed <laughs> since since I originally published it. So. Yeah, for sure. Marcus, this has been amazing. Marcus's website, meonlylouder.com, uh, coming soon. New course. Course is already up there. Check that out, meonlylouder.com. Today's presentation is brought to you by Castos Productions, productions.castos.com. If you're a B2B company looking to outsource your next B2B podcast, chat with us at productions.castos.com. And if you're looking to start a podcast for the very first time, castos.com.